Good evening, and welcome to my How Healthy Are You weekly educational podcast. My name is Dr. Thomas Brewer. I'm a Ph.D. chemist. For this evening's podcast, I have four questions to answer, so I'm going to get right to them. Uh, The first question is about migraines and what a person can do about them that's natural. So I have three techniques for that. And uh, if the first two don't work, I I guarantee the third one will. So many migraines uh, materialize due to incomplete or inadequate water consumption. Now, if you're one of those people that doesn't drink a lot of water, what happens if you get a migraine and you're not drinking enough water, it's just a toxin buildup. And that could even be due to food allergy. So uh, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. We've talked about water consumption many times. Um, but that may not be you. You may be drinking plenty of water and still get migraines. The next thing is relaxation breathing. So. I have a video about this on my YouTube channel, Dr. Thomas Brewer. It's also in Facebook under Dr. Thomas Brewer, same name. Um, And very briefly, you uh, inhale through your nose very slowly for, say, three or four seconds. You hold your breath for about nine or ten seconds, and you exhale very slowly for around 12 seconds. And you can change these numbers. You can inhale for just three seconds, hold for six seconds, exhale for nine. So the point is you hold your breath longer than it took you to inhale, and you exhale for a longer length of time than you held your breath. So it's an inhale, a hold, and an exhale. So I go into this in a little more detail in the video, but it is very relaxing. Now, that still may not get rid of your migraine, though I guarantee it will help. Um, But there is a technique that takes advantage of... uh, essentially meditation, or, or, or not meditation, <laughs> uh, massage. Most migraines, if they're not due to toxins, the other leading cause is tension. And once there's tension, we lose blood flow because the muscles tighten. So now all we have to do is loosen those muscles with massage. So if you take your thumbs while you're having a migraine, and you put your thumbs behind your skull, so it's behind your head, and you move your thumbs in circles for about five seconds, and then move. Move to another spot behind your skull in the soft tissue back there for five seconds, and then move again, and move your thumb in circles. You will find some tender areas back there. That's okay. Those are the muscles that are tight, that are inhibiting blood flow. And just keep moving. So you're going to do the circles or apply pressure for three to five seconds and then keep moving. And that works very well at getting rid of migraines. Um, Really, with migraines, you shouldn't have to spend any money to get rid of a migraine. It's all things you can do for no cost, which are my favorite. The next question was about something I learned about a few years ago. I was initially introduced to it when I was in graduate school. It's called deuterium depleted water. So a lot of people won't know what deuterium is. So the way hydrogen atom isotopes go, we have the regular hydrogen atom, and then we have deuterium, and then we have tritium. Now, tritium is a radioactive form of hydrogen, 
and it's used in hydrogen bombs. So we don't need to talk about tritium. But the second one's called deuterium, and it's known as heavy water when, when it's the, uh, in, the two hydrogen atoms for water. Water's known as H2O, so heavy water would be known as D2O. So instead of a normal hydrogen atom, you have this deuterium. And the difference is hydrogen has no neutron in the nucleus. It's just a proton in the nucleus. But deuterium has one neutron. And a proton and a neutron have the same weight. So we can think of hydrogen weighing one atomic mass unit, but uh, deuterium, since it has one proton and one neutron, it has a weight of two atomic mass units. And that's where they get the word deuterium, which means two, and tritium means three. The tritium happens to have two neutrons. So two neutrons, one proton, total mass is three. But with deuterium, one neutron, one proton, total mass of two. Well, it was found out that when water is, uh, has less of this naturally occurring deuterium, so this is just a natural ratio of the amount of hydrogen with zero neutrons versus hydrogen with one neutron, there, there's just this normal ratio in nature, but if you decrease the amount of deuterium in the water, uh, when people drink it, they have higher energy, a better metabolism, very anti-cancer. And so I learned about this fairly recently from a friend of mine. He happens to go back and forth between Moscow and the United States. Uh, and he has a business here where they they make the deuterium-depleted water. And at first, I didn't know what the main benefits were, but uh, it, it's actually good stuff. And, and the question was, you know, is it real and, and, and is it good? And the answer is yes. It's somewhat expensive. It's, it's about 4 to $10 for a quart of it. And you'll have to determine what the dosages is and how much to drink. I don't have that information. But the main answer to the question, it's quite good stuff. And it's very difficult to make because we're trying to separate atoms that just have a slight weight difference due to an extra neutron in the nucleus. So this is a, a very difficult process. Um, this is the sort of thing they are doing in the Middle East with the centrifuges to make um, high-level radioactive elements, uh, plutonium. Again, they're, they're trying to separate out these isotopes. It, it's the same concept with the deuterium-depleted water. It's a very tough process to separate atoms just based on a, a little minute difference in the nucleus. So, uh, yeah, deuterium-depleted water is decent stuff. The third question was uh, a little bit of, at least my take on fasting and, and the benefits. So most people are familiar with intermittent fasting, uh, which is where you just don't eat um, all night, a little bit, um, you know, while you're sleeping, before you go to bed, and, and perhaps a few hours after you get up. So uh, the easiest would be 12 hours, which most people can do. Just don't eat a snack after dinner. Um, all the way up to 14, 16, and 18 hours. Um, so you're only eating a few hours in a 24-hour day, perhaps six hours of the 24, or eight hours of the 24 hours, something like that. And it's very beneficial as we age. And you're going to notice, as, as we all age, you're going to notice that your health will improve 
the less you eat, but you don't want to stop eating completely. And we're going to learn about that with the next question, which deals with protein. But fasting for a very short time is extremely beneficial for all of the autoimmune diseases, meaning it, it minimizes them, um, it, it'll get rid of all of the symptoms. Um, so that would be like MS, lupus, both types of arthritis, whether it's osteo or rheumatoid. And I know rheumatoid is the autoimmune version, but even osteo uh, will show benefits. Fibromyalgia, even those of you with hives or, or strange marks on your skin that you can't explain. Now, with hives, it's those are usually due to some sort of a food allergy. So if you're fasting, uh, well, you're obviously not eating the trigger food. But for the autoimmune diseases, it's somewhat similar. It allows the body to self-heal. So these typical fasts are water only. And the time range is typically a day or two days, something like that. So it's nothing too difficult. And after that water-only fasting, uh, so there's no food, no solid food for a day or two, uh, what's followed is a plant-based diet. So no animal-based food of any sort. And the only concern here is while you're fasting, it's often a good idea to monitor your electrolytes just to make sure you're getting enough electrolytes. Remember, fasting isn't, um, it, it, it isn't normal, right? It, it's, a, it's the beginning of dying. But um, when done correctly for a short amount of time, it promotes self-healing. And that's why the intermittent fasting works so well, because it's pretty short. It's not even a whole day. Um, typically would be, say, a, a, a big intermittent fasting routine would be 18 hours, uh, but you're still eating during the other six hours. So fasting promotes self-healing. It is very beneficial, and it seems to work better as we age. When we're young, you want to eat lots throughout the day. Um, for athletes, they even get up in the middle of the night and have a small meal. So they're eating all the time. And to help promote growth of the body and essentially the strength of the entire body, you need to eat a lot. But as we age, it tends to be a little... Um, well, it works the other way. It, it, it's detrimental. <laughs> as, uh, as we age, eating a lot is very detrimental. So um, that's my take on fasting. Um, if you're new to this, just, just do the intermittent fasting. If you have some sort of an autoimmune disease, I, I highly recommend you do, uh, at first, just a one-day water-only fast and then for the next few days or week, do just a plant-based diet and you watch. Your symptoms for lupus and fibromyalgia and if you had hives or any arthritis, it's all going to improve dramatically. Cost? Nothing. No medication. No supplements, no medication. Just, uh, just being smart, really. Okay, the last question uh, kind of fits in to the last, uh, to the one on fasting or the previous question, and it's about protein, and especially protein intake after 65. Um, but what I'm going to say is really true even um, after f age 50. So there's quite a few people out there that either have diabetes or they know someone with diabetes. And if it's type 2 diabetes, the first thing one would want to do is not consume the bad fats, and the worst of those is canola oil. 
Um, and that way you get to absorb insulin and sugar through a cell membrane. I've talked about this previously, but for those of you, when I talk to you and I, we talk about diabetes and, and it seems to be getting worse and your sugars levels are getting higher and higher, and I ask, what kind of oils are you consuming? And all they're consuming is coconut oil and olive oil and avocado oil and grapeseed oil, all the good oils. It's, it's always the animal protein. When we consume animal protein, it increases our risk of diabetes, and it gets worse as we age. So that's the issue with protein intake. Now, here's some misconceptions, though, as we age. Our protein requirements are really the same whether we're young or, or old. It's just the effect on our bodies, if it's animal-based, uh, hurts us more, and, and it's very hard on our kidneys. We tend to lose about 1% of our lean body tissue or muscle every year as we age, and that number goes up dramatically from 1% to 2 or 3% uh, if you're sedentary. So as we age, we need to keep moving. As long as you keep moving, uh, the amount of muscle loss will be less than 1%, which is quite good. Um, losing muscle with age is not inevitable as long as you move and consume protein. Your protein requirement's the same. It's just you have to shift from getting all of your protein from animal-based foods, and you've got to start shifting to vegetable. And that way, you won't have what I was talking about previously about um, autoimmune diseases, but also diabetes. That's what happens as we age. The chance of getting diabetes goes up exponentially the more animal protein we eat as we age. So get your vegetable-based protein, beans, fruits, and vegetables. And the advantage is that these are alkalizing foods. So they have an alkalizing effect. And vegetable-sourced protein, beans, fruits, vegetables, they go a lot further than animal-based proteins. Animal-based proteins, they get to be used one time. Those nitrogen atoms only get used one time. They make a lot of ammonia in our kidneys, and the body works very hard to get rid of that ammonia because it's toxic. But the vegetable-based proteins, we get to use over and over, so they go a lot further. Uh, also, because they have an alkalizing effect, they help prevent something called metabolic acidosis. What that means is as we digest our food, the body has to release hydrochloric acid into our stomach. And in order to digest food metabolic, we have this acidosis, meaning the utilization of acid to help not only digest the food, but it also helps digest our own muscle tissue. So this is very catabolic, meaning we're eating ourselves. We're, uh, this acid is essentially dissolving our lean body tissue, and, that, and we are living off of it. We are metabolizing it. So it, it's called catabolic. So we're eating ourselves. We're eating our own lean body tissue. And... This is promoted as we age and as we eat animal-based proteins as we age. But if we shift to more alkaline protein sources, which is going to be fruits and vegetables and beans and uh, high-quality rice like quinoa and things like that, they still have plenty of protein, um, but we don't get that metabolic acidosis. These protein sources have an alkalizing effect. And 
those proteins will minimize muscle loss. And, and that's the whole point as we age. So we want to not be sedentary um, and to shift to more and more vegetable-based proteins. Now, the way I look at this is you, you had plenty of time to eat as much meat as you wanted in your 20s, in your 30s, and your 40s. Uh, but I recommend once you're in the 50s and higher to start decreasing your animal protein intake. You don't necessarily have to go to zero. That's tricky. But you won't need nearly as much animal protein as you did when you were younger. You still need protein. You still need a lot of it. Um, but you want to shift the source from animal to plant-based. Okay, so that's all I have for this podcast. If you have questions, uh, please email me or call me or text me. I might have missed a question from either Sandra or yeah, I think there might have been one other person. I might have missed their question. If so, uh, just email me, text me, or call me again with your question. I'll make sure I answer it next week. And thanks for listening. I'll be here uh, next week, same time.